And as you can see, we've, we've abandoned the small uh, panel format. We've decided against, no. This is different, obviously. Um, and I'll let uh, Sherry Goodman and Jim Townsend tell you more about this, but this next hour and a half comes out of a, a, a challenge that really came from our partners at the Wilson Center when we were putting this meeting together, and they said, well, don't just have the scientists talk to the policymakers, right? Let's, let's have the conversation go both directions. And I turned it around and said, great, help us put together a session that would have policymakers tell us something about what we as indigenous knowledge holders and scientists need to know. And what came out of this is this demonstration. This is only a demonstration of a method that's used in decision making uh, that a lot of us, in, at least in the science world, aren't that familiar with. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Shari Goodman with the um, Wilson Center, and you can introduce Jim and everybody else. How's that? Okay, thanks. Thanks, Brendan, and thank you all for being here. We're going to try to keep you awake. Uh, after the lunch hour and uh, entertained and engaged. Uh, I'm Sherry Goodman. I am at the Woodrow Wilson International Center Polar Institute. Actually, like many of you, I have multiple hats. I'm at the Wilson Center. I'm also at our partner, the Council on Strategic Risk, which is the home for the Senate Center for Climate Insecurity, which is one of the co-sponsors today, and our other partner um, is Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, Jim Townsend and I are here in our capacity with the uh, Wilson Center and the Center for Climate Security, uh, as well as my partner, Peter Davies, uh, of, formerly of Sandia and now the Woodrow Wilson Center. I want to thank all of our partners. I want a special nod to Lori Parrott of Sandia. Thank you. And to our great Wilson team that's helped put this together, Marisol and Clara here in the front row. Uh, but if you have any questions or any problems, it's all my fault. Um, because I have three kids, so like, you know, the mother, I'm the mother of climate security, I'm the mother of my three kids, and I did hear uh, Denali and the others of you this morning that we want to bring the youth more into it. I'm willing to take off 25 years right now. <laughs> okay, but we are going to bring you in as part of the discussion um, because we're all of us... Uh, you know, we, want, we are going to be very inclusive as much as we can. Uh, in the 90 minutes, we have to do a demonstration of a scenario that posits a nuclear shipping incident in the Bering Strait, so we can look at a series of both how to respond type questions and what kind of research we should be planning now for a future scenario. So this is a way of bringing together in a format um, that would normally be done over at least um, most of a day, if not a couple of days, uh, with actual role playing of people in different roles. We're not going to do the formal role playing, but we have a lot of players who have been actually in those roles, decision making roles, in the Coast Guard, Navy, Air Force, uh, operators, local first responders, uh, scientists, indigenous, uh, of indigenous scientists, and operators, governance officials. So we've kind of covered the gamut with a great group of talent up here. I'm, I'm going to direct you to look at their bio so you can read more uh, about their expertise. And what we'll do today is raise a number of issues, questions, problems that need to be addressed uh, now and in the future associated with a potential nuclear shipping incident in the Bering Strait. So with that, I'm going to introduce um, my co-pilot here for this exercise. Jim Townsend and I have worked together in the Department of Defense um, since the, well, since the 1990s at least, right? Maybe back even a little further. Uh, I served then as the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Environmental Security. Uh, Jim has most recently served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for NATO um, uh, and European Affairs, and so we've both worked uh, in the region in the national security 
context, and we're pleased to be working here and engaging with all of you today. Over to you, Jim. Thanks, Sherry, and hello, everyone. And I do know this is hard after lunch, but I think you'll find this interesting. And I, and I guess I would start off just to say that we're kind of doing this for you in the sense that if you, through the course of the next um, uh, hour and a half, hear something that uh, sparks your interest or you see a problem that you think you can have a handle in correcting, that's great. That's, that would make the, that's the takeaway for this, is for you all to leave this room and say, I'm going to start working on that particular issue. Because the big goal of what we're doing today is to try to give tools and resources to our successors in 2050 um, in, in Alaska or in the Coast Guard or in other parts of the government or the indigenous community that might have to wrestle with the problem. So this isn't necessarily about a nuclear aspect or just maritime security. It's not a specific scenario issue problem. It's a bigger picture of what do we need to be doing today or tomorrow after this conference is over to prepare the tools, to do the research, the scientific research, to make sure that 50 years from now, um, whoever's going to handle a problem that might look like this, they've got resources then that they don't have today. And that's what we're trying to do. And we're going we're gonna to tackle it through a couple, a couple of ways. The first one is this. This is, we've got, this is a two-parter. The first part is going to be the actual scenario. The scenario has got two parts in and of itself. I've got part one. Sherry has part two. In part one, what we're going to do is lay out for our, our panel a situation that has happened in the Bering Strait, in the shipping lanes there. Uh, and, and I'm going to try to get at two aspects. Um, the first aspect is in Alaska, among the Alaskan government and the, the, the resources that uh, decision makers have in Alaska, how, who should be talking to whom about this and what does that chain look like just in Alaska? Because the second thing that I'm going to try to get at is what's the connection between those folks in Alaska and the national and international authorities, whether it's, uh, whether it's the Homeland Security, whether it is the Department of Energy, whether it's Russia and China, because as you'll see, these two ships are, are not American. Um, how does that work? How does the network work between Ala within Alaska and then between Alaska and the other uh, elements of the, of the U.S. And this also includes the indigenous community. How does that all work together? Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort that out, and then I'm going to turn it over to Sherry, and she's going to step the scenario up a bit. This is where we're going to have um, this maritime incident have a nuclear energy aspect to it. We're not talking about nuclear weapons. We're not talking about anything like that. But we're talking about an icebreaker that all happens to be nuclear powered, as the Russian icebreakers are. So she's going to handle then this aspect of, of are, are, are that, is that network that I described, are they able to handle a problem that's been stepped up like this? So for the first 45 minutes, we're going to do this scenario, and we're going to hear from uh, all of our experts on, 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 uh, as they grapple with these problems. The second part of this, of this uh, event uh, here on this agenda is the last 45 minutes where we're going to drill down with all of you as well, part of this. We're going to drill down on um, what are those things that we need to be working on today or tomorrow. So we're going to, in a sense, we're going to harvest the discussion that we had in the first 45 minutes so that we can really identify some areas of work, scientific, uh, other aspects, policy making, uh, uh, communications, uh, Alaskan government, indigenous community, what are some areas that we need to begin to work on? And then we're done, we go into a break, you get to have some coffee and, and uh, recover from this. So uh, without further ado, Sherry, I think I'm going to go ahead and start. Let me, um, let's see, is this, ah, there we go. So let me give you uh, the background to what's happening in this scenario. They have all seen this, but you haven't. So I'm going to read it to you, and you'll kind of get the idea of what's happening here. By 2050, Russian oil and gas fields are producing large quantities of LNG that is shipped year-round along the northern sea route. In winter months, during the extended navigation season, Ice-hardened LNG tankers are escorted by Russian nuclear-powered icebreakers. In late November 2050, an LNG tanker 
is transiting the Northern Sea Route, escorted by a Russian nuclear-powered icebreaker. This tanker is Chinese-owned, but operated under a flag of convenience from another country. So you have something that you see every day, an icebreaker and a, uh, and a commercial ship behind the icebreaker making the transit. The first move. A powerful winter cyclone hits these ships as they approach the Bering Straits region. And the LNG tanker, astern the icebreaker, collides with the icebreaker. The master of the LNG tanker sends out a call for help. That's all we know is that there's been a collision. Uh, it's happened in a, in, a, in a very remote area and uh, there's been a, a distress call, so that's all we know. So let's now figure out what happens, what's the network, both particularly in Alaska, that comes into play uh, to begin to address this. And I'm going to turn first to Church Key uh, to, to talk about this, and then we'll move on from there. Church. Thank you very much, Jim. I'll be here quickly because, frankly, this is uh, this, the initial response framework uh, for a distress call being going out to this would certainly go first to the United States Coast Guard District 17, headquarters of June, Alaska, commanded current day by Rear Admiral Matt Bell. Distinguished colleague here to my right, uh, Mr. Phil Thorne, the Arctic planner for District 17, works directly for Admiral Bell. The, essentially, you would see the Coast Guard response piece of the equation swing into action quickly because there's a distress call. The questions would come out is that, first of all, is the recall go out? Is it actually received? Who receives it? Because you are in an area where, at least in current day, communications are not assured. So there's, now we're going to make the assumption here that by, Arctic, uh, by 2050 that that region has got better communication than it has today. So a distress call made is actually a distress call received. In this case here, then the District 17 folks would be on the horn with the vessel masters to try to just ascertain is that the state of distress that they're facing, are they taking on water, are they able to maintain some semblance of control over their vessels, or are they literally at the mercy of the weather patterns? So as initial query back to, to ascertain what are the problems that they're facing, what level of stress are they under, and then they'll generate the kind of response based on nearest va vessels, whether it's a, a good Samaritan or whether it's going to be uh, a, a Coast Guard asset that would be nearby to respond. Over. Well, well uh, and thank you then. That's, that's exactly what we would hope the Coast Guard would be able to do and that, that the communications infrastructure is there, which is a question. But let me ask, who, uh, who then in the Alaskan government, who in, the, uh, in terms of first responders uh, in Alaska would be getting a call as well? Because it sounds like right now it's in a U.S. Coast Guard circuit, hopefully talking to the Chinese master, but maybe not. But let me ask... Um, who, who, would, who wants to tackle that? What's going to happen in terms of, of Alaska? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll speak to that. Uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, Church Key is, is correct. The Coast Guard, uh, this incident would start, um, is, is right now at the beginning, it's a, for, first and foremost a search and rescue case for the Coast Guard. It may evolve into other things as the incident progresses, but it's a search and rescue case. And, 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 and as was indicated, we would launch our ships and aircraft in order to do that. And we would also rely on partners that uh, would be available to help us. And I, I think of the state of Alaska and um, uh, for help on shore with the troopers. Uh, also, we have a, a, a good standing relationship with the Department of Defense up in, up in Anchorage with their Alaska RCC. And there are also uh, Department of Defense aircraft that can also help us in that initial response. We have uh, very long-standing and mature relationships with them, and we can uh, uh, reach to them to help us with that initial response to save lives at sea. Other points on Alaska, and then we're going to jump into Alaska to more of a national network. So more on Alaska. What's going to be happening here? Uh, it's late at night. Uh, most of uh, the, you know, the Alaskan officials uh, are in bed asleep. There's a few watchstanders uh, trying to handle this, uh, but, but uh, the Coast Guard is busy on this. The Coast Guard might be talking to DOD, uh, but in the governor's office? So uh, probably, there's a, forgive me, and, uh, Jim, so as a starting point, it, there's going to be initial flurry of calls go out. So the watchstanders will be talking to fellow watchstanders. 
The District 17 is probably going to make an initial call to the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. Their emergency management section that works within essentially a commissioner to the governor will be their command center, but they're principally three miles inbound to shoreline and, of course, the territorial spaces. But there will be a lot of calls essentially among the response, community first responders within the state, between other mariners, for example, uh, the Marine Exchange will also at the uh, Juno, which is information sharing protocols with the mariners across the Alaskan coastal waters. Again, that network would be energized with all the players that are the regularly on scene people will actually be on scene and trying to ascertain the problem, how severe it is, what need the steps are, the need, are required to be taken. Yeah. Over. There is uh, also a regional response team. Um, which has uh, representatives from uh, all of the federal agencies plus state uh, agencies and others that would be uh, contact or be put in play uh, by Coast Guard. Uh, and uh, that then uh, initiates conversations similar to what Church is talking about throughout the federal and state uh, networks. So in, in terms of dealing with DHS, in terms of dealing with uh, DOE, uh, which might come later, but in terms of dealing with a lot of the national authorities, there is an exercised network uh, that is robust uh, already in place between those first responders, whether it's Coast Guard, whether it's others, and the, the authorities in Washington, particularly DOD, was mentioned that that's, that's something that is uh, regularly exercised up in the, up in the high north and the Bering uh, region. That's something that is not uh, unknown to those uh, agencies that need to work together up there. Well, this, is, yeah. this is your cue, Phil. Yeah. Well, for the DOD, that, that's true. What, what is potentially lacking and we're working on is the time of year. So we have uh, moved from a spring-summer mindset to try things out to a winter, February, March time frame to work things out because until now the environment did not generate a sense that that was going to be the case. But being the fact that it is now 2050, uh, given the presentations we've had up till this point, we'll have a lot more open water, if you will, so it would also have increased the transit. We'd be in contact at Northern Command, both from the watch standard point. <clears throat> as soon as this occurred, uh, there would be contingencies that would go into place to get people ready. Uh, get flexed up, people will be moving towards airports. In the event the Department of Homeland Security asked uh, for additional help from the Department of Defense. Well, let me ask you another quick question and then we're going to move on to another, uh, to my final uh, question, and that is um, in terms of uh, infrastructure that is there now or that might need to be put in place in the future, and in terms of speed, because as we've discussed in the past, we're talking about a huge geographic region and not a lot of resources that are up there right now. So um, I think what's been laid out is very reassuring in a lot of ways that there are, there are, uh, there is a network there, there's a network in communication, there's changes being made to make sure that it can operate in all weather. Um, but um, I, but in, when you look at the logistics and the geography and the speed at which you might need to respond to this maritime incident, are there some issues there that you think that are something that we've got to work on between? Yeah, there's uh, no place to go, you know, for for us to be in response. So if there would be something to be looked at, is where would you put it in 2050 or now for 2050? How could you sustain it? Do you have to have somebody there to sustain it? Could it be in a warm status, uh, cold status, and you would just go? Because today, if you need it, you take it, and when you get there, you take it out when you come back. So it's a big place, it takes a long time, it's very expensive to get there. A lot of the challenges exist over the, the tyranny of distance and we have to take a look at those infrastructure things. There are very few sources of bringing in response teams to sustain them and to help once they're there. Particularly if we're dealing with a mass, mass casualty situation. Whether it's the Coast Guard doing search and rescue, whether there's health issues, et cetera. There's, a, there's another aspect to consider left of that, and that's, uh, and that's when we think about Arctic, in the, this situation in the 2050 time zone, how much could automated uh, information systems aboard ship? There are right now currently a, a relatively discrete set of information protocols are sent out on, a, on an automated basis. 
what more could you put into those systems in the year 2050 that could help achieve a better domain awareness or, or incident awareness by the command and control agencies that were been charged, invested with really at first response. So could you have exactly, you know, transmission of discrete information regarding uh, water level within the ship, within the power plant of the ship? You know, what are the other things that are not even envisioned now could be incorporated into AIS in a time zone which would make domain awareness or instant awareness more readily achieved? Well, I think that point actually, and then I'm going to turn it over to Sherry, I think that point is, is critical because when we talk about what, what you've all laid out in terms of the network, uh, it's something that's, that, that uh, is exercised, and I think we're going to see more done during, in bad Arctic conditions like this to try, to try to deal with that. There are breakthroughs in technology, whether it's AI, whether it's in drones, that type of thing, that can help deal with this tyranny of distance. Uh, but um, unless we plan for that and we budget for that and we look for what those resources need to be, we're not going to have those in 2050. So I think that's one thing that uh, whether it's the, the U.S. or the state of Alaska or the Coast Guard in, 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 in the specific case, uh, that's something I think between now and 2050 we're going to have to really pay attention to because these technology uh, breakthroughs are happening now that we need to take advantage of. Yes, ma'am. There and there and then Sherry. Yes, ma'am. So just adding on to the um, infrastructure that we might want to hope would be in place by 2050 in a case like this in these new, act, newly accessible water areas would be the ability to quickly gain access to trajectory analyses in the atmosphere and also in the ocean so that when we have ma uh, hazardous materials traveling through these areas that are hazardous themselves, um, we know where to turn to get a quick analysis. Okay, let's say there's a release of a contaminant. Where's it going to go in the atmosphere or where's it going to go in the ocean? And have that in place ahead of time so that we're not looking through the yellow pages trying to find a good ocean modeler right. when and, something and like that's this exactly, happens. that's exactly, I think, what uh, hopefully in the next few minutes we're going to see come out as exactly the need for that type of thing. That's exactly right. Yes, sir. That's the, that's the point I was going to make. I'll, I'll take it to the next step. Part of this issue is uh, if you're going to be dealing with a search and rescue uh, right off the top of the bat with a, uh, in a situation where you have a storm, you need to know whether or not you can get your assets safely there. So you're going to need to be able to know whether or not you have uh, what the current condition of the atmosphere and the ocean sea state right. is, what the near-term uh, state's going to be. And so we're already seeing that in terms of the infrastructure that's there, a lot of the infrastructure that deals with the United States for, for weather monitoring and forecasting is really optimized for the, con the CONUS in the middle latitudes. Exactly So right. you have the goes east and goes west of loitering over uh, the middle latitudes, but the, uh, the amount of satellite data available over Alaska is not nearly as much or not nearly as, uh, as, as often. And also the surface net network and the upper air network are very, very sparse there. So that is already today a problem for our National Weather Service people as well as those the Air Force that are trying to forecast and, and observe in that area. That's so, a great point, and that's exactly what is, these people are going to need in 2050 when this happens, and it won't be there unless we right. start working on it now. Yes, sir, real quick, and then Sherry. quickly, you yeah. Got so by 2050, we need to transform our, our idea of infrastructure planning, right? Uh, because presently, uh, infrastructure planning does not come with emergency response planning. So infrastructure that is being planned now does not come with an emergency response plan. That's up to the communities. So by 2050, we need to transform that, that, how that works. Boy, that's a very, very good point. That's, a, that's an excellent point. I, if we had a couple more minutes, I'd want to drill down on it. But Sherry, let's step, let's step up the scenario. Okay. All right, next move uh, in this scenario is, you know, nuclear icebreakers are steam turboelectric, and during the collision, the electric motors are damaged. The icebreaker loses power and grounds off a populated island in the Bering Strait. The potential for release of radioactive contaminants is a realistic possibility, and there is potential for seaborne contaminants to be carried north <coughs> and then eastward in the Alaskan coastal current or airborne contaminants to be carried to Alaskan coastal and inland regions. Okay, first uh, question associated with this next development is what emergency response systems in indigenous communities would be <coughs> called upon for response to a nuclear maritime in incident? And do these emergency response systems have knowledge and effective communication lines with state and federal level agencies responsible for radiological incidents? 
Gail and Austin, as our uh, residents from uh, the Bering Strait and from the region, um, would you like to take a first crack at that? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I hope that we, you know, transform another another idea about response capacity, and that is that we have the political will now to put in place robust response vehicles. Right. Uh, we, we think that, we hope that if we put terrestrial infrastructure in places that that will increase our safety. That's not necessarily so. We can have the largest, most, resp most robust response vessels there now, right? So aside from that, if, if that's the case in 2050, we also need to look at how we uh, involve local communities. So when you look at the way uh, DEC or others or, or Coast Guard respond to incidents in, in well, Western Alaska, uh, the local person is usually one of two people, the VPSO or the president of the village corporation or the village, the, the tribe. Can you split, uh, split, the, split. the village public safety officer, right? Thank you. So that, but however, that VPSO person has other public safety tasks that cannot take them away from their, their safety role, right? But unfortunately, we tend to do that. If it's the president of the tribe, well, do they know all, all of the things they, they need to know to help the response? Maybe, maybe not. By 2050, we have to change that, that dynamic and, and put those things in place. Gail. The other thing is um, that would need to be ascertained is whether there are assets in place um, to, to deal with a, a situation like this. And um, I don't, uh, one of the things to remember too is that Alaska is a really large state. And so if there are assets distributed throughout the state, uh, the question then becomes how long does it take to get those assets to the location? of the island and what happens um, in the interim. If I lived on the island, I would want to know, and I think communication with uh, folks on the island would be really important. I would want to know whether, um, what kind of contaminants we're dealing with, whether it's um, flowing away from the island or coming to the island, whether there's a need to evacuate the island. Um, and, um, you know, I think that there would be a, a real need to ensure that whoever is determined to be in charge there, and I think that if you look at the villages, basically people know who to turn to if there is an incident, um, and uh, ensure that that person is kept um, in full uh, communication with whoever is in charge on the outside so that they can uh, plan and prepare for uh, whatever needs to be done. Thank you. Randy, you are our nuclear expert from Sandia. With, so. <laughs> with some background in um, commercial nuclear safety and emergency response of this sort. And I just want to add, because it seems to go with the flow of the conversation, is that um, in the U.S. commercial sector, it's up to the plant operator to decide are we in trouble? Are we going to be in trouble in two hours? And then they decide whether there's going to be a, a site emergency declared and then what happens uh, next. And then it, I believe it turns to the governor essentially to make a call. Are we going to evacuate? And there are rehearsed um, planned ahead evacuation strategies that, in, that include staged evacuations where Special needs, general population, prisons, schools, things like this are handled in an orderly manner or even more uh, protective measures such as keyhole evacuation where if you know that the, um, the direction of the wind is going to take the, the um, effluence in a certain direction, you'll, you won't evacuate in that direction. You'll evacuate in a different direction. You may need to change your strategy. So these things all have to be worked out uh, ahead of time. And generally, the communities prepare uh, for such an, such an evacuation. And by the way, the contaminants are iodine and cesium. And those are the two poster child uh, threats. Iodine presenting a very near-term, high radiation dose. It's often the lethal dose. And then cesium-137 with the 30-year half-life takes 100 years for that to drop, a factor of 10. 
So this is the land contamination and the, and the threat to the fisheries and the threat to the, uh, you know, the economic consequences. Okay, and we're going to get to drill down on some of those questions a little bit more uh, as we go along. Mark, Mark's got a uh, naval background and done a lot of work on Arctic shipping and foreign direct investment. Thank you. Um, since you've mentioned nuclear, in my mind, that really ups the ante considerably, and it transforms the incident from, sim from a search and rescue issue to one a la, uh, at, at least of equivalent stature as the Deepwater Horizon. You have, it's not something that just involves the United States. It involves the United States and Russia. It involves the United States and some country um, that the, the flag of convenience operator as well as the Chinese government. And that in order, and it would have to be a seat of government response and a principal federal official would have to be appointed as quickly as possible to go in and do immediate triage to assess the, you know, the status of the containment aboard the, you know, the integrity of the reactor and whether or not evacuation. You, it, and also you would want to decide whether you want to en uh, establish containment areas or exclusion areas to prevent local population or shipping from getting nearby for fear of radiological contamination. Um, and so I, I think that once you inject that, and, and then you also have to consider the, the, the potential, and the State Department would have to be heavily involved in this, as to whether or not you might have to involuntarily board some of these vessels in order to not, not, not to seize them, but to make them safe, to try to contain something from, from getting out of hand. Becca, Becca from that, the Naval War College. Um, I think the, uh, one of the first priorities would be to open up ongoing channels of communication with both the Russian and Chinese governments here because of the sensitivity of the issue. Um, the Chinese shipmaster would have almost certainly have called back to Beijing before calling into the Coast Guard. So I think it would be safe to assume that the Chinese government would be fully informed of what's going on. Um, you know, ditto Russia. These are um, very significant assets. And I think Mark makes some great points about it would, you know, the priority would be securing permission to go on to that vessel to offer assistance. If there were any sticky points there, things could get very difficult, very quickly if we had, you know, a Russian government-owned icebreaker in U.S. waters, um, that's a real knot, and the best way to untie that would be to have a really clear channel of communication at a high level between Washington and, and Moscow, because on the Russian side, there would be a number of different agencies potentially involved. That ship would belong to Rosatom, Rosatom Float. Um, the Russian Coast Guard would be operating in the area and responding. There's a number of other Russian agencies their uh, Ministry of Emergency Situations, their Environment and Natural Resources Ministry, um, that would potentially also be involved. And so getting up to a high enough level that on the Russian side somebody could get all of those agencies corralled and get some straight answers I think would be really important. Complicated situation that requires early warning and practice to anticipate. Okay. Um, who hasn't weighed in here yet? Okay, Lawson. But, but there is practice. It's been practice for five, five decades. The U.S. Coast Guard in Juneau communicates weekly, I think, with the FSB now and, and, and the Russian Coast Guard. So immediately, I'm sure that Admiral Bell would communicate with his counterpart on the, well, whether the Admiral is in 2050, would communicate immediately and, and keep those ties. So it does tell you at the practical maritime level, we need to have this kind of relationship with the Russian right. Federation mm -hmm. through the decades and not, not just at the highest level, whether it's there or not. But at the practical maritime level, there are all those connections today, and they've been here for at least five decades through the Soviet era. And so I think working those issues and being transparent early on in a disaster like this is very important. Okay. We're going to go on to the next question, which is that given the potential for radionuclide release to both the ocean and atmosphere, what do we need to know about regional ocean currents and atmospheric circulation patterns, and how and where contaminants could potentially be transported along the Alaskan coast and into the interior? And do we have the modeling and analysis capabilities today to make accurate predictions? Okay, 
It all depends Austin, what you mean by right? accurate. Austin, and then I know Jim, we're going to get you in here on this too. So as I mentioned before, the uh, the level of observing and analysis uh, in that part of the world is uh, not nearly as good as it is in the continental U.S. and other places, not just from a radar and surface and upper air, but as well as from the satellite. So I would say that uh, our ability to predict uh, this would be limited today. Hopefully by 2050, we will have upgraded uh, our observing network uh, based on the, the ability to, to field it as well as prioritize the area. Uh, secondly, the modeling aspect is more complicated there. Uh, without the observations to feed the model, you're not able to provide as accurate a forecast as you, were, uh, you would yeah. have otherwise. Uh, so the other part is there is complicating factors. It's uh, there's a lot of terrain. There's also sea ice. So this looks to me like a if we're going to do this very accurately, uh, except for a very short period of time, we need to do this in a coupled model. So we heard from Marika yesterday in terms of the climate scale. This is really not much of a different problem for a medium range forecast scale. And this is a problem that is complicated and is probably beyond the capacity of any one agency to do by itself. That's why there are communities here. And so I would hope that by 2050 that the U.S. government would have gotten their act together and helped build a community modeling and observing system for Alaska and the Arctic region that we're all working on together. Because what good is it if we're, the Air Force is getting one forecast, DHS is getting a second forecast, and the locals are getting a third forecast, and they're not coordinating their efforts? It has to be, frankly, just as important they have the, the same picture as it being an accurate picture. Thank you. Who, Austin? So th there is always or usually a subsistence activity occurring uh, in this region, right? And if the if the if this emergency were to occur in a you know a nasty time of the year, what we now typically call the shoulder seasons, it's still going to be nasty. It might be ice free, but it's still going to be nasty. If there were a release, we might be also dealing with a marine mammal stranding response, and there. Uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in region, in, in consultation, in collaboration with NOAA, NIMFS, uh, you know, we've, we've already looked very briefly in, at the beginning stages of what a large scale marine mammal stranding response would look like. But we haven't looked at what it would, what it would look like if it's a, a, a nuclear uh, in incident. Okay. Jennifer and then Church. Okay. And then so John. I completely agree with the need for uh, a much better observing network in these new regions where shipping is going to be um, taking place. And in addition to that, I think um, starting now, looking forward to 2050, um, we're seeing um, a climatology of storms in the Arctic that's changing. Yeah. So as the ice recedes from the shore and stays away from the shore longer, it's changing the tracks of storms. The Arctic used to be considered a graveyard for storms. It's not that anymore. And it's because when we expose this open water, especially in the winter time, we set up these locations where there are these huge differences in temperature between, let's say, the land and the water, or between the water and the ice edge. And those big differences in temperature are like energy sources for storms. And so we're seeing storms not just move up there and not die, but we're seeing them regenerate along these edges where the, where the temperatures vary so much. So there's a lot more research that needs to be done now in order to prepare for 2050 when, we're, when ships are planning to go up there. It's going to be a whole new climatology that they need to think about, especially in February. That would be the time when it, this would be um, the biggest change that I would say. Right, so the oceanographers and the meteorologists, they all are going to have, uh, and the weather folks, all going to have a lot more work to do informed by uh, a, a diff the science that you've just described. John. John White, former Navy oceanographer. Thank you. And let me, uh, I just want to sort of amplify on Jennifer's co comment. Uh, while there's a lot of churn going on in 2050 over whatever media we're using to do our 24-hour news cycle at that point, um, people are going to want to know, is there radiological, radioactive stuff being released? Maybe the Russians might say something along the lines of, we got it under control, there's nothing to see here. Maybe people might not believe that. What we know is that we 
are developing technology now, especially with miniature drones, things that we can put in the ocean in very short time scales that can measure, to, act, to, to go in and detect, measure, then monitor, and even help to accurately pre predict are there things in the atmosphere in the ocean, where are they going to go, at what levels they are. So I think we need to make sure that we are thinking about in our research in terms of technology and science, how are we going to address a myriad of problems like this, whether it's radioactive contaminants, whether it's oil and gas, or whatever it may be. We, have the, we know we're going to have the technology, but are we funding, are we thinking the right things in terms of all the bad things that might happen like this, and making sure we're really funding and the international and national level the type of research and technology development that will allow us to address these problems. All right, Mark, Randy, <laughs> Becca. Then we got to go to our. We got to keep going on our questions here. This okay. this is very quick, um, and this picks up on what John was just saying. I, I think in this scenario highlights the fact that we have needs for research and technology, in which demand greatly exceeds supply and the ability of one country, namely the United States, to pay for it. We do have an oil spill response agreement, although there's not much in the way of any kind of funding commitments. And I think if we're looking forward to 2050, we need to fortify that agreement to ensure the other coastal countries in the Arctic that they begin to commit more funding to, for research and technologies and perhaps prepositioning of assets to be able to respond to something like this. Randy. And kind of just quickly to add on to this pr issue of prioritization of what should we be preparing for. And again, referring back to the commercial reactor community, all power plants, all nuclear power plants in the U.S. are required to perform a probabilistic risk assessment. Right. And this is a broad scoping uh, mm -hmm. assessment of yep. all possible threats, internal events, things that break, external events like weather, and, to, and, and by taking a, a broad systematic look at this, we can ferret out what are the drivers? Mm -hmm. What are the ones that the tall poles in the tent? What do we really mm -hmm. need to worry about? And so this is something I would like to suggest that somebody take on the role of doing a risk assessment, a risk study on something like this. Good point. Okay. Becca, did you want to jump in on this? Think about modeling the environmental response to some kind of nuclear release in this area, I think it's important to remember that in the 1960s, the United States government proposed blowing a deep water port in northern Alaska using a nuclear bomb as part of the project chariot. Um, and that project came very close to, to being realized. And as part of the studies in support of that, the AEC actually um, released radionuclides into the environment using some controlled explosions near um, Point Hope, I think it was. And then they studied the response and how those radioactive materials went through. And they, they found that um, since the food chains in the Arctic ecosystem are quite short, um, radioactivity actually moves through the ecosystem and into the human inhabitants eating foods from the lands very quickly. Um, and so I think that legacy um, and that history should be really in, in, uh, at the forefront of our minds as we think about doing more studies and research and preparation. And I'm going to echo a point that Lawson made about the important of trans importance of transparency here. Because we're not coming into this with a blank slate. Um, and in our efforts to become better prepared, I think working hand in hand with the communities in the area to make sure that they are involved from the start would be a really important best practice. Yeah, so the nuclear legacy in Alaska from prior activities is important in how we think about the future and how incidents might unfold in the response. That leads us well into um, the transition, which we've already started. We conceived this as the first part being about the scenario, how it would unfold, and in some ways the operational response, and then the second part being about the research and what we need to understand now so we can be prepared. Of course, we've gotten into that somewhat, but let's go full, fully into that now uh, in asking what planning, research, and policy actions 
Had they been taken 25 years earlier, okay, would significantly strengthen situational awareness, effective communications, and operational response to this 2050 Arctic incident. And Jim, you have a, a question yes, that's uh, been submitted. Uh, from this, in the Slido uh, realm, which I urge all of you to use to ask questions, Francis uh, sent in something I think is important to state right off. And Francis said that uh, key assumptions are being made about capabilities in 2050, communication, response capabilities, coastal facilities, et cetera, to make this response successful. Mm -hmm. It would be great to document these so we can prioritize them now so that they exist then. And that's what we're trying to do. And I think uh, that's another task, I think, that needs to be taken on in the, in the first instance. And that is trying to do a, um, a kind of a stop taking to document uh, what we have now and where we need to go. Uh, so Francis, thank you very much for sending that in. There are some other questions that have come in that I think have been answered about Russia and, and uh, other aspects to this. Um, let, let, me, let me, if I may, jump into a real quick question uh, for the Coast Guard. Um, you know, when, we, when I was up here with my first question about the networks and within Alaska, between Alaska and the U.S., uh, we talked about first responding, and you all laid out a great point about the, how ready the Coast Guard is, the links that are there, uh, that this is a, this, this, that at least in this first move was a standard search and rescue maritime uh, emergency that you all are very well uh, exercised and capable of, of taking on. We upped it with this, this nuclear aspect, if you will. Uh, and so going back to the Coast Guard, uh, as, that, you know, I, as I think about it, and that could be completely wrong, but, but certainly given the, given the geography uh, and the size of the Coast Guard presence up there, things are stretched pretty thin, particularly in bad weather like this. Um, as, the, as the skipper of that Coast Guard vessel that reaches uh, the island first, um, is, do you, how, how well uh, equipped do you think that skipper is to provide some first uh, uh, responses to, to what's happening there? We talked about the drone aspect where you can get that from a drone also that can go around and take measurements. But, um, you know, I think it, it would seem that up till now a lot of U.S. Coast Guard training deals with a standard search and rescue problem set. It's great that NORTHCOM is, is, is looking at exercising during bad weather. But if, if that skipper is faced with a, a potential nuclear problem with a Russian ship that's probably unfamiliar to all of us, this icebreaker isn't well known, uh, I'm sure that skipper on the bridge doesn't have the blueprints to look, but that skipper is the first one there. That skipper is also having to talk probably to the indigenous community. It could be that that tribal leader or some of those folks are trying desperately to talk to the Coast Guard to find out themselves what's happening. Do you, is the Coast Guard ready for this kind of thing in that region, or is, or is this something that we have to work on between now and then as well? And this is this is no this is this is this is no, no slam no on the pressure, Coast Guard. No, no, this no is, pressure, but, but but truly, this is no slam on the Coast Guard at all. I mean, the Coast Guard does heroic things up there. But as we're looking at the future, was the future in your planning also including something like this Russian icebreaker? I can say that you know a lot of um, a lot of large incidents at sea. You have more in common than they, than there are differences. You know, if we have a, a ship that's grounded, we have a potential pollution incident. Uh, certainly, a radiological incident is is a really unusual and and uh, and a different uh, thing. I can say that our ships and 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 we have our units do have a radiological detection capability and a protection, and the Coast Guard does have a response uh, function. I would also say as soon as it becomes clear that it might be a radiological incident, you know, this becomes a national incident. And that skipper on the Coast Guard ship, you know, at sea will uh, do what they can and the Coast Guard will do what they can, but we also have linkages and a process at the national level. We call it the Maritime Operational Threat Reduction Interagency Process to call the experts and to bring the right forces to bear. So at that point, I think uh, Avril Bell and the Coast Guard would look to form what we call a unified command. And a unified command is under the National Incident <coughs> Management System. 
it's a way for people with different authorities and different resources to come together to address complex problems. Uh, the Coast Guard doesn't have the solution to all of the problems you're discussing, um, but we have a lot of capability and we would look to partner with others. Had, um, and you might not know, but, but has this been exercised? Is this something I, I think in my mind, as that unified command comes together, which is absolutely right, with, with other players you know, who normally might not do this kind of stuff, but they're coming into this unified command because it's a very specialized problem that we've got. Um, I guess um, those folks that are coming into this unified command, do you think they have the, re the right resources coming in too? Or would you have folks come in and they'd say, hey, I was assigned to unified command. I just flew in from Washington and I, I really don't know about nuclear stuff, but I'm here representing, you know, whatever agency they are. I mean, how deep do you think the bench is that when Admiral Bell says we need a unified command, we've got to move fast, I want you to do the reach back to the scientific community and others in Washington and bring these folks in, um, I'm wondering how deep that bench really is, and, and uh, or will people show up saying, yes, it's important that my agency be here, and I'm their rep, but I really, you know, and I know there's not a real answer to that, but, but has this well, kind is. of thing been exercised? There is a real answer to that, so I'll go back to Deepwater Horizon. So that stood up very quickly. The National Incident Command structure stood up very quickly, and one thing on Phil's point, so just because this is a nuclear incident, anything in the Arctic is going to be a national incident, quite honestly. It doesn't have to be nuclear to elevate to that level. But with the uh, Deepwater Horizon, we stood up um, in headquarters. You know, you had the command centers down in Homa, down in Louisiana for that. But also in the D.C. area, we stood up interagency solutions group where we had a table, a uh, big square table, where we had representatives from at least 20, if not 30 agencies, all with roles in the response. So that we were all in one room, could quickly communicate with each other, pass information up and down the chain of command. So that structure is there, and it will be put in place very quickly. Now, for something like this, this is a bit of an outlier. So there will be others that will be added to that, um, obviously. But we will we have the connections in place, and those will happen very quickly. The question becomes, is the stuff that goes up and down the chain of command good stuff in terms well, <laughs> of the scientific, scientific and, data and that type of thing? And that's where NOAA comes in, for sure. So I was going to actually bring this up uh, in the previous question, um, and that is, how do we do a better job of sharing information and science with Russia, for instance? Um, because of the difficulties with Russia, uh, we, have, we have sometimes uh, some real problems getting with our, sci with our, our corresponding Russian scientists. Uh, and I think uh, in this particular situation, to have the Russian scientists, their data and information available for the response is pretty important. Otherwise, well, we have a whole, a really a whole side of uh, the strait uh, that is not being used appropriately in terms of the data and information. And so uh, there, there are attempts uh, to begin to try and work better with the Russians on the science. Um, I think there's a modeling conference maybe that uh, Church is putting on this, uh, this fall uh, that will include Russians. But uh, I think that's a real weak point for us. Uh, we have not done a very good job of establishing better relationships with the Russian scientific community. That's a great point. So yes, the sir. Russian thing, that's a thorny subject all in itself. But I want to relate something uh, based on my experience with the accidents at Fukushima. And that was the, the first signal that there was a reactor meltdown and a release of radioactivity was the next day when the Unit 1 reactor building exploded. And this was captured on TV. Everyone's seen it. But up until that time, it was pretty much a fog of war situation. The plants were in station blackout, which means there's no AC power, there's no DC power, there's no lights, and there's no HVAC. So it's a very confusing uh, situation. It's very difficult for those people on board ship to know what is the state, is the core being cooled. Uh, fundamental questions like that. So you may, as soon as a reactor is at risk, you may need to be prepared for the worst case scenario in advance of any uh, declaration by the you know, captain that, oh, it looks like in a couple of hours we're going to lose this thing. And by the way, losing the cooling on a re reactor of this type in shallow water is going to have serious consequences. because we have a question here um, that came in on autonomous technology was key in responding to the Fukushima uh, 
uh, disaster and what role would it play in 2050 to prevent exposing more lives to danger? And we know that autonomous systems are playing an ever larger and larger role um, in helping us understand not only response, but changing ocean and other circulation patterns. And I'd like to add to that, that question. And, and that is, uh, it's great to have an autonomous system, whether it's a drone or whether, whatever it might be. Uh, but if Alaska is not ha having, or the Coast Guard for that matter, are having trouble on the Hill getting budgets for this, uh, you could, 2050 guys could find themselves in the same place they are today because the money wasn't there, the systems weren't purchased, or they don't operate in the Arctic environment. That's what would worry me about that. Jim? Yep. <laughs> Jim, I'd like to tackle this, if I could, um, a little bit to what I was trying to get at a little bit earlier. but. Strategically, in unified command, the, the audience may not really understand clearly what that role and mission is. What does the term unified command mean? Essentially, is you, you assemble a team led, in this case, by the United States Coast Guard at, at a flag level, so a, an admiral, two, three, four stars, depending on how significant, how fast it got, but ultimately, senior leadership in the U.S. Coast Guard that has departments and agencies, the United States government, federal government come in, and they're all going to be working in addition to the federal government, you're going to have a component of the state officials. You're also going to have components of local officials, local public officials that would come be a part of this unified fabric. Everyone's bringing the responsibilities and authorities and essentially to try to help essentially establish a series of lines of activity and efforts to address the problem. One of these things, and getting to what you aspect there, I could envision in this, the idea of autonomous systems is to reduce the human footprint in responding. So you can remove people from the, from the, at least from the on scene and back them away and put autonomous robotics on scene to deal with this so you don't put life and limb at risk. Meanwhile, you still have an evacuation problem. I'm worried about the, the people who are living on that island, that they, we need to figure out, working with the public officials on that island, the best evacuation plan of activity. It, for their own safety, but doing this so not giving orders, but working with them to try to say, here's the threat, here's the threat if you remain, here's the threat if, you know, here's the risk reduction if you depart. Getting vessels on scene, whether they're air or surface vessels, to get people evacuated away from the scene of danger. So essentially, the unified response in some lines of activity, smart people from across the federal, state, local community to make decisions to reduce the risk of the problem of the vessel versus reducing the threat to the people who are actually in the vicinity of a potential catastrophe. Over. Well done. Yes, ma'am. Um, also, we're not going to be the only ones potentially using autonomous technology up there. I can very well imagine the Russians sending a drone in to take a look, and if we've got a Russian drone entering our airspace, we're going to have a decision to make about whether to allow it in or to shoot it down. Drone versus drone. That'll be really cool. Right. And so it's... Uh, <laughs> That would add a layer of complexity that it would again um, argue for having an open channel of communication because, you know, if they start sending unmanned technology in and we don't permit it, then this incident could escalate even further. I think with technology today, if, they, if a satellite circling the Earth can uh, take a photograph of someone's license plate, that probably uh, the U.S. military could move satellites into position, hopefully fairly quickly, to um, at least get a sense as to what's happening on the ground. But in terms of actual boots on the ground, you know, we Native people have the highest per capita um, service in the U.S. military, and I think that you would find that there would be people, um, veterans and others, in those villages who would be willing to put their own lives at risk to if needed, um, go and take a closer look at what's happening um, on, on that uh, vessel. And um, I think that that would be, uh, you know, probably pretty particularly helpful um, in assessing uh, the risk and everything. Um. Yes, sir. Jim, so from the Coast Guard perspective, a lot of times we talk about autonomous vehicles or drones and with the three Ds, dull, dangerous, and dirty. Those are the jobs we want them to do. Um, I can tell you right now, we've flown drones off of Healy, or we've tried to. More often than not, we're limited by the environmental conditions. We simply, the winds are too strong, they've iced over, and we've crashed them, we've recovered them, we've never left them out there. Um, 
But there, there's extreme, it's an extremely challenging environment. What works in the lower 48 is probably not necessarily going to work in Alaska. So right. that's an area of focus. Right. The other thing is you mentioned a while ago about the, the skipper of the, the Coast Guard ship. I'm wondering what Coast Guard ship that would be. <laughs> Hopefully by 2050, we've uh, recapitalized our icebreaker fleet so that we have three heavies, three mediums. Please pass that along to my leadership so they know I got that plug in. Um, Is it recapitalized it, to your satisfaction yet there, Shannon? <laughs> but we do have to have the ice-capable assets, and it's not just ships. It's planes, it's helos, it's everything. You know, again, what works in the lower 48 may not work in this environment. You talked about being in a storm environment. It's going to be an extremely dangerous situation, and you're going to have to have ice-capable assets to be able to do something in this region. And, you know, that's my concern about that. We've, we've heard about the Unified Command Church laid out a very very good wiring diagram on how that works. Uh, the reach back to Washington, although I have to say, uh, having Washington people show up in Alaska and say, we're from Washington, we're here to help, doesn't, that doesn't give me any real good confidence. But, <laughs> but, um, but, I, but I think that's exactly the point. We can make the wiring diagrams and get the command structure done and, and even exercise it. But my fear is whether it's just an icebreaker or just another uh, uh, Coast Guard uh, uh, resource out there or the autonomous high-end stuff, if we're not going to get money out of Congress, it's not going to be there. And this situation, should it occur, we're going to have, maybe we won't have a skipper, but if we do, that skipper might not have a lot of resources at his or her disposal to, to, to begin what is a huge national problem but the on-scene person is that Coast Guard person. All right, um, I want to read see. a couple yeah. of questions and comments that we've gotten here so we can bring in um, comments that we've received. Okay, Molly McCammon of the Alaska Ocean Observing System observes that Congress last year appropriated more than a million dollars to install high-frequency radars in the Bering Strait to make available near real-time ocean circulation observations. AUS is installing the pilot system later this month. So I would, uh, we, we can open that for discussion in connection with kind of what sensors and sensor systems do we still need, um, you know, to advance the kinds of observations and data we would need to respond to this uh, situation. And also to be fair and bring in some others, we also have another comment for an inclusive exercise, which we called this, the panel lacks diversity. I'm just going to put that out there. We've tried. Uh, but we could be more diverse. Um, yes, more women and more indigenous, more women, more indigenous people. Um, and so, yes, but that's the trend. We're moving and we can always do a better job. And we also, I observed that at the beginning. That's why I asked Denali and welcome you to jump in here at any time in terms of the youth element or others here from the audience um, who want to bring in that inclusive, uh, diverse if, if you want to share a different, a different perspective or a different comment. So um, those are two that, um, uh, and then one other question here. Looking backwards, do you think that incidents like the, like Exxon Valdez followed the same storyline and did the response have happened as planned for such a scenario that should have been well anticipated? Okay. Lawson. Yeah, back to this uh, basic infrastructure <laughs> investment by the Congress. Uh, you, you probably all know that only six or seven percent of the uh, U.S. maritime Arctic is uh, chartered in international standards. So between now and 2050, uh, that skipper of the uh, ship that is responding needs to have some modern charts aboard as a basic 101 <laughs> maritime tool. Uh, besides the basic right. infrastructure of Arctic port, uh, ACE and navigation. We've talked about communications and a robust uh, observing network, but there are a whole bunch of tools that relate to the practical maritime operations, which, which are increasing not in 2050, but today, at least on the Russian side. And we, of course, we also lease offshore. We've leased in the past, leased in the future. Still the place is not chartered. Still the place doesn't have robust, what we would consider robust maritime infrastructure for a uh, uh, emergency response or environmental response. Hey, uh, Jim and, and uh, Sherry, one thing would offer is that if one vessel of master's name is Ollie, the other one's name is Stan, and they're looking and saying, another fine mess we got ourselves into. 
So what we should have been able to do to avoid all in stand, getting the vessels in a fine mix, is something I was thinking that Lawson was going to get to, and it is by 2050, having enforcement mechanisms for the International Maritime Organization's Polar Code that gets into the fact that decision support, why are you doing putting vessels in a perhaps a no-go situation? We have so much at risk where folks are entering into a storm as opposed to taking, taking safe refuge. And instead, they put themselves in a spot where they put you know, the community at risk and really putting themselves at risk by allowing themselves to steam in a situation where they should probably not have been there in the first place. Decision support tools to help vessel masters make smarter decisions to reduce the risk that they're putting themselves in the crews and their vessels should be something to be considered. IMO may be an enforcement mechanism to help make that happen. Yeah, that, that's a good point, Church. And let me bring out another a comment we got is, and a question, which uh, uh, Mark, you probably have a, a thought on, is what's the role of international agreements to restrict transit through the Arctic during times of year at high risk for extreme weather conditions? Mark? Thanks, Sherry. Um, I'll get to that in a second. But it, to, to build on Church's comment, I mean, Yamal is here. It's a major industrial operation. And if you, you actually look at the level of international participation, there's actually six large oil uh, exploration fields, multiple, multiple wells. So this, this thing happening, is, it's going to happen. It's very, it's, you know, God forbid it doesn't, but when you look at the level of industrial activity that's occurring in Yamal, this is hardly surprising. The nuclear angle, of course, is, is, is something that I would argue is somewhat uh, unexpected. In terms of what should we have been doing uh, looking forward, or actually looking back a little bit, yes, the International Maritime Organization, I think, needed to play a much more aggressive role in terms of looking at the northern sea route. Should there have been efforts to work collaboratively with the Russians to try to establish an international rule set like that's, that's present in the Turkish Straits to deal with safety of navigation, to deal with possible suspension of transit during periods of bad weather. And so that would have required working with R Russia collaboratively five or six years ago. Um, the second thing is the Polar Code. The Polar Code is good, but th there's, multi there's problems with it. There's nothing to deal with how much will a ship owner pay in the event of a of, of an accident. In the case of an oil tanker, at least based on my research, the best you could possibly get is $2 billion. And that's a drop in the bucket in terms of what one of these incidents would cost. There's also no mechanism to ensure that states are following the Polar Code because of the principles of flag state control. There's no port state control agreement as of yet. And that's something that needs to be put in place. And last but not least, Unlike in the North Sea, where there's an OSPR convention among the various states there that deals with response among the, the, the countries and also cross-liability uh, schemes so that if there's a claim that can be quickly dealt with, there, there's no, no systems in place that would uh, address the Arctic environment. And those are things that we need to be looking at now. In terms of extreme weather, I think we had a good example of um, a good decision that was made earlier today where uh, a tourism vessel uh, um, elect couldn't get into the port of Nome because of bad weather and so they what they did was they uh, bypassed Nome and went into Port Clarence which really isn't a port uh, it's a um, natural deep water harbor and they shuttled their tourists um, to shore to tell her on uh, zodiacs and then uh, drove from Nome to tell her to then uh, uh, take those tourists into Nome itself. So I think that there are, um, thankfully, uh, people out there who realize that um, in certain situations you can't take a chance. And so there was a good decision made today not to do that. So there are alternatives, even if there is really no infrastructure in place now. Um, although I, I do hope that the U.S. does uh, invest in infrastructure in the Arctic because I think it is critically needed uh, that there are places that folks can go to that are natural uh, harbors and um, wait out uh, bad weather. Becca and then Phil. Um, I want to echo a couple points that Mark made. Um, in terms of the relationship building on the Russian side, I think um, Yamal is a huge project. Gazprom is a very powerful player in the Russian system. 
Um, those icebreakers are operated by uh, Ross Adamflot, which is another very powerful actor. I don't know if the Russian Coast Guard can direct those actors particularly well in that power hierarchy, and policy on terms of transport in the Bering Strait is not set by the Coast Guard. That's the Ministry of Transport. So you've got different actors within the Russian system, and we don't, um, I think thinking that our relationship with the Russian Coast Guard is going to be adequate to give us entree to dealing with the scope of <clears throat> actors involved is not accurate. I think building more relationships across that system so that if something like this happened, the, Ru the U.S. Coast Guard could call Ross Adam float and be like, hey, your icebreaker is grounded. Because I don't, I don't know if we could assume that the Russian crew on that icebreaker would let the U.S. Coast Guard on board. That would be an interesting question. We should make sure to have Russian speakers on board of that U.S. Coast Guard vessel, right? And you have a line back to Ross Adam float to say, hey, you know, we're, we'd like to go on board. Um, so I think... I think the relationship that the U.S. Coast Guard has built with the Russian Coast Guard is very important and valuable, but <coughs> diversifying that a little bit to deal with the scope of possible contingencies as industrial development goes forward. Um, having a line into Gazprom so we could talk to them about turning one of their tankers around if the weather was looking bad. You know, that might be a good thing to think about. And you know, it has to be reciprocal, too, with the Russians, where we'd have to let them go on board one of our ships if there was a, you know, something where uh, that was in the offing. And, uh, and we'll see if we could live with that. So it's a very, very good point, very important point. Phil. So two things, one on the, um, the exercise diversity. Uh, certainly, as a Department of Defense guy, welcome stakeholders and partners. I have an Alaskan command representative here. Raise your hand, Amanda. So uh, talk to one of us. I don't make promises I can't keep. I don't write checks that uh, I can't cash in, I didn't sleep at a Holiday Inn Express, so. But we can certainly entertain how we can make it uh, better. They, nobody's complaining of too much time, too many people, or too much money. So our exercise program is a somewhat economical way of getting after some of these wicked problems. To the question about how do we make this important to Congress. Um, now this is a Phil Brown opinion, not a DOD opinion, this is just me. But somehow Congress passed a law that required flood insurance when you lived in a 100-year floodplain. Now, I was, I was schooled very carefully by a former oceanographer of the Navy, not the one on our panel, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen every 100 years. It means there's a 1% chance of it happening all the time. So we haven't had five 100-year floods. We've just had five times where a 1% chance came true. If we think that something like this has a one in a 500 year or whatever the percentage is of that, maybe that's an argument. You passed it for floodwaters. What is preventing us? What would make it important enough for Congress to consider it? Because you don't buy insurance because you think something bad is going to happen. Because you know it's never going to happen. But you have to buy the insurance. So what can we do to get in the conversation to make it important enough to the legislators to create an environment for safety and security. Shannon. I'd like to weave a little bit of this together and, and going a little bit back to what Church said and what Mark talked about, um, the international aspect of this and governance piece. So <clears throat> Melanie mentioned it yesterday, the Bering Strait Port Access Route Study. So it's a little bit of a misnomer. It's not about accessing ports. It's about waterways management and deconflicting those waterways. I think Austin touched on it as well. So those studies are open for public comment, and we highly encourage people to comment on those. But what that study ultimately led to were the voluntary routing guidelines through IMO for the Bering Strait region. As the other part of that, those shipping lanes were highly charted so that they're very accurate to reduce the risk of something mm -hmm. like this happening. I know the storm was a major incident or a major factor in this, but... We also have another one out there now, the Alaskan Arctic Coast Port Access Route Study, which is meant to extend those shipping lanes around the north slope of Alaska. It is open for public comment, and we highly encourage people to go in there, take a look at that, and provide that input. What are going to be some issues regarding the waterway usages around that region? To include, you know, deconflicting it with subsistence hunting and fishing, you know, and about vessel safety. So those are the types of things to prevent these from happening to begin with. And once we identify those shipping lanes, then we will make sure that those lanes are charted to a much greater detail than what we've seen before. 
Okay, Denali. I just want to say on the uh, area of communication and public comment period, this is something that we're facing with both the draft environmental impact statements as well as something as commenting on shipping marine uh, infrastructure as well. We need infrastructure for communication. When I was out in Bristol Bay this summer, I was not able to communicate and talk and make any kind of public comments on any of the draft environmental impact statements or if I wanted to um, communicate uh, my opinion on the marine shipping because we do not have that access in our rural villages. And so we need to be addressing communication issues in Alaska first and foremost, and then being able to address it out on the ocean as well. Thank you. Thank you, Denali. That was um, a, a very good point. And I want to get, now we have about, about uh, we're getting close to the end here, and there's an important set of questions that's come up around um, food security and uh, the supply chain in such an incident about what would happen, um, what do we need to uh, better understand about ocean circulation patterns and radionuclei transport issues um, because we have uh, already an abundant fishery uh, in this area which will probably be by 2050 even more productive. Uh, given the warming waters, and then we also have effects on the inland food supply chain. Um, I recall myself now over 20 years ago in the Department of Defense, at the end of the Cold War, the Norwegians were very worried that sunken Russian nuclear submarines uh, in Murmansk close to their, um, close to the Norwegian fisheries were releasing contaminants, radionuclide and hazardous contaminants that would affect Norwegian fishing grounds. And that led to a formal program we ran for 10 years on Arctic military environmental contamination to help the Russians offload liquid waste streams from nuclear submarines. Uh, so can, I, can we get some discussion on those, on those questions? John and then David. So thanks, I think that's a really great segue into something that really bridges a few of these. One is that, is that we think about making de decisions based on science, whether they are an actual decision, do I take my Coast Guard cutter that close to a nuclear incident or not, or longer term, what's the impact going to be in my waters off of my country, or longer term, what's the impact going to be on the food chain of having these things in the ocean, maybe that's years even down the road. Uh, so what I think we should be thinking about for toward the year of 2050, we have the opportunity now to put into place the international structure for what could be a unique and transformational international capability for operational environmental pre prediction to support a decision framework of all those levels. The Europeans have done it with the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, the European model. We all watch for the hurricanes and wonder if NOAA's is better or not. I'm not going to get into NOAA's business on that. I have my own opinions. But why don't we have an Arctic operational center that can pool the best scientific resources from all the Arctic nations and others toward a best science-based modeling and prediction of what's going to happen at various time and geographic scales. If we could shoot for that and bring the science community and the diplomatic community together after a lofty goal like that, I think we can answer a lot of these concerns in the future. Great point. That's a, a very good point. I'd like to hear other comments on creating an Arctic prediction, Arctic, what? Arctic Domain Aware, well, we've got an Arctic Domain Awareness Center, that's, but Arctic Domain Prediction Capability yeah. is what I vote for three about. of those. Okay. <laughs> I think everyone's in favor of it. Now we just have to do it. Uh, there's been some discussion around uh, Admiral White's suggestion, uh, so that's something that uh, at least uh, has come up, uh, and I think we could certainly explore. What, what I wanted to mention is... Um, I was talking to somebody from Barrow at one of the breaks, and they were telling me about the interesting new species that they were finding in Barrow. And uh, if you have an incident like this, um, it's going to be imperative to understand what the ecosystem looks like and what's there. Uh, that ecosystem is changing so dramatically that by 2050, if we haven't done some uh, 
serious work uh, in trying to document the changes that are going on in that ecosystem, uh, we would be way, way behind. And there's so many implications from understanding that. One of the first things that happens when you have an incident like this is whatever the commercial fisheries uh, is surrounding, it's going to be shut down if there is one. Uh, subsistence uh, is going to be a significant issue as well. And so in terms of a research question, the whole where are we going with the, the migrating species and what's the ecosystem going to look like, I think is incredibly important to and underlies so many of the decisions that will be made in whatever you do with the response. Um, real quick uh, to this point about the, the center uh, that, uh, that I think is really important. And I'm going to read this from Anonymous. Um, Anonymous said that, I thought Gail was going to discuss indigenous knowledge when she brought up the role of local residents. We haven't heard any mention of indigenous knowledge with respect to wind, waves, currents, etc., ice. Would someone care to comment? And I, I would I'd throw that out for comment, certainly. But I think as we deal with putting together the best in terms of science, and the, you mentioned the diplomatic community as well come up. I think having a very strong indigenous presence and voice on this would be really helpful too. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom there, I think, that could, get, that could help us better judge uh, the, the weather patterns and all kinds of other things as well. Yeah, I mean, there's something I'd like to take a comment and, and hop on that one real quick, because, and then I'd like to offer for my distinguished colleague, Gail, for some reflections. I think there's this conference last two days that really hit on the aspect of the need uh, for a co-equal representation of traditional ecological knowledge and, and really indigenous-based science versus that quote of Western science. Collaboration is really not just collaboration, but integration. So, you know, various, there's a lot of us that are, are associated with the community of science. Uh, our little center is one's focused on principally heavily applied research. There's a lot of other research enterprises that are either federally sponsored or academically driven, but ultimately that go between fundamental science and all the way through the heavily applied. Um, traditionally, that has been within stovepipes. And so how do you find a way to break the stovepipes apart and really get down to the point where indigenous people who are experts in indigenous knowledge can sit side by side and, and co-produce? We've talked about the need for co-producing uh, knowledge between Western and indigenous space science. But at the end of the day, we need to be about the business of actually setting up a mechanism that actually co-produces as a, as a, as a de dedicated outcome, not an applied after, uh, afterthought. One aspect for this is that our center, is just one center in this whole enterprise, is partnering ever so more closely with, as, as we're funded by the Department of Homeland Security, we collaborate closely with NOAA, National Weather Service, Office of Naval Research, et cetera. But ultimately for us, the more we collaborate with, for example, Anupiavik, uh, Nupiat Corporation Science, UIC Science, is one example where you're actually seeing people who are shepherding science um, from an indigenous vantage point, integrating that with, with our, what we're doing to our research. That's kind of the models where I'm thinking that we need to go forward towards the future. Um, thoughts on that, uh, President uh, Schubert? Well, I think that the person who wrote the note um, really uh, hit the nail on the head. And I was mentioning to Austin earlier that, um, unfortunately, I'm kind of on Alaska time. So I woke up at 2.30 this morning and uh, wasn't able to get uh, back to sleep. Uh, but indigenous knowledge is really critical. And I know that there are, are a number of agencies that do actually consult with um, our people. My, my um, mother is 92 years old, and she's, she lives in Yinlaklit. And I was talking to her the other day, and um, she mentioned that you know, she has seen many, many, many changes in the environment and in Yinlaklit and in what's happening uh, in, the, in the oceans and the water. And uh, someone mentioned uh, fish species um, moving north uh, because of the uh, warmer waters. This, this um, past summer in Yinlaklit, uh, you know, we had a, a, a die-off of uh, salmon. It was an early run salmon, you know, all the, um, because the water was too, the river water was too warm. And uh, fortunately, it uh, recovered um, somewhat. And so I think that people had a, a somewhat successful um, salmon harvest for subsistence purposes. But it is really 
uh, critically important for scientists and other experts to consult with indigenous people as um, you know these matters move forward. So thank you for uh, bringing that back to the forefront of my brain. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much, President Schubert. And now we are, we're gonna go to sort of, and that, that's really started us on our round of kind of closing and wrap up comments. Uh, not required, but if, if any of our panelists f feel uh, compelled to say one last thing, and then we're gonna bring this session to a close. Becca, <clears throat> John. I wanna to touch on one comment that we haven't addressed yet. Someone asked about Exxon Valdez and the legacy there, and I'm really glad that was brought up because that was 1989. Um, and in the wake of Exxon Valdez, that tanker was single hulled, so we went to single hulled after that, and the captain was drunk, so we imposed tighter restrictions on navigators after that. But those were reactive responses in the wake of one of the worst oil-related disasters that we've experienced, um, the environmental effects of which are still present today in the environment. Um, and so I think we have an opportunity now looking at the industrial development that is getting up off the ground in the Arctic to take a proactive, preventative approach so that we don't repeat those same mistakes. Um, and I'm really glad that somebody brought that up. It's important to remember that we can learn a lot from those disasters and we should use those as motivation to make sure they never happen again. Yeah, I, I, don't, I want to second that point because we know when there were plans to do the offshore oil drilling a few years ago um, and those, when you looked at drill down onto, into those plants a little deeper to see kind of what would happen if there was an incident. There were, a lot, there were still a lot of missing pieces in those, in those plants. So, um, you know, that, that's, I want to under, underscore that point that that really needs to, we need to bear in mind what, what those risks are as we go forward with development uh, plans in the region. John Austin. I'll be quick, I'll just say, uh, we are reminded this season during hurricane and typhoon season that there's no shortage of scientists and others who are willing to put forth their own map projections and predictions on what's gonna happen with an event. Um, <laughs> going back, <laughs> going back to- Gotta shore <laughs> me right here. <laughs> going back to the event in the Gulf of Mexico, I was a resident in operating the U.S. Navy's ocean model that was provided to NOAA for Deepwater Horizon. It is important as we establish an incident response framework and unified commands, this is in, U this is in the U.S. federal territories, so NOAA would likely have the authoritative science-based knowledge and information about what's going to happen. We need to make sure in the science community that we recognize that and be very careful of what we might tell our good friend who works at Northcom or at CNN on our basis of, well, the loop current is going to erode and oil is going to go up the East Coast and invade all the beaches of North Carolina. It's important to understand that science is good, but we need to work to, together toward a best answer. And uh, this kind of, uh, of an, an incident, the indigenous folks are going to really want that best answer. And we run danger if we give them multiple answers, and I've been there, there's nothing more frustrating than multiple wrong answers. We need to have the best one and recognize that is in the best interest of our indigenous yeah. populations as well as our U.S. agencies. Absolutely. And thank, right. thank you, John. Right. And that, that underscores the several comments that I saw come in about how social media, uh, real-time reactions are going to uh, distort you know, what we know about the facts of the situation in any given incident. Okay. Well, the knowledge right. uh, piece who here is, that... Who is next? Sorry. I think Austin. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, thanks. I, I really hope we can do more of these kinds of things because we really, really need them. There are, there are lots of examples, lots of lessons that we can learn from what we already are doing and what we already are responding to. So in the northwest part of Alaska, in the northwest spill area, you know, we, we deal with some 18,000, 20,000 gallons of oil or hazardous substance every single year, right? And What's often the case in rural Alaska compared to other parts of Alaska is that like our oil spill response, uh, the responses are open rather quickly and then close very rapidly. And in the decades or so that we've had uh, oil spill response uh, in, in Northwest Alaska, 
There's never been a, a wildlife impact ever associated with any of those spills. So I, I would hope that uh, we could have some, uh, you know, that the conversation like this could invade uh, the, the parts of government, the parts of uh, rural, rural communities so that we can elevate these values and have these value, value discussions because maybe over the last several decades there have been wildlife impacts. We just haven't gone that far and, and got into them. So uh, I, I really hope we can continue this kind of thing. Well, I, that's a great closing note, and you'll enable us to end um, right on time uh, to say that we, we have enjoyed, I hope I can speak on behalf of all of us, that we've enjoyed participating uh, in this kind of scenario-based demonstration exercise with you, and hope we can do it uh, with more of you in greater depth in the future. Um, all right, Denali would give you the very last word here very on behalf word. of the next generation that will be in charge in 2050. <laughs> Problems we're handing off. Okay. <laughs> well, I just want to say if we want to continue these conversations, and I invite you all to come to Alaska and have these conversations with us in our home area, with our people, on the ground, with our elders, and with our youth. Bill and I will be there next okay. week. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you all.